Let's work a couple more examples of finding antiderivatives. So let's start with finding the antiderivative of uh, little f of x equals 1 over 1 plus x squared, where uh, the antiderivative capital F at 0 is 2. So we can just start out by guessing a, a formula for the antiderivative, capital F. So we're looking for some function whose derivative is 1 over 1 plus x squared. But this function, 1 over 1 plus x squared, that looks familiar as a derivative. It's the derivative of arctangent. So this is just inverse tangent of x. But to get the general antiderivative, we need to add a constant, because always you can have an arbitrary constant in your antiderivative. All right, so now we have a formula for capital F. But if you look at the problem, we actually haven't used all of the information we have about capital F. We know that capital F of 0 ought to be 2. So if we translate this into an equation, right, this says capital F of 0 should be 2. But we know what capital F is. Capital F is given by inverse tangent of x plus a constant. So if we plug 0 in there for x, we get inverse tangent of 0 plus a constant. So we get this equation. The left-hand side of this equation is 2, and the right-hand side of this equation is inverse tangent of 0, which is 0, plus c. But look, this is telling us what c is. This equation that c says that c is actually 2. And now that we know c, we know that the antiderivative capital F is actually inverse tangent of x plus, right, before this constant was unknown, but now we know what this constant is. It's 2. So what we've seen here is this extra piece of information, this f of 0 equals 2, this was enough to determine what c was supposed to be. So this determines c. So uh, the extra data point that lets you figure out what the constant is, this is called an initial condition. This particular initial condition was actually at x equals 0, but initial conditions don't have to be at x equals 0. They really could be anywhere at all. Let's look at an example. So let's find a function f of x that goes through the point 1 comma 3 and so that the slope of the tangent line to f of x at x is given by f prime equals 1 over x plus 1 squared. So we're going to find a formula for f of x. So if you look at what we know here, we know f prime and this data point here, 1 comma 3, this tells us that f of 1 should be 3. So those are the things we know. And what we want is a formula for, cap for uh, little f. So in the situation that we're in, we know a derivative, and we want the original function. So really, this is just a, another antiderivative problem. In this particular situation, the role of the antiderivative is played by little f. And the role of the original function is actually played by f prime. So f prime is our derivative, and um, we want to undo that derivative to find little f. How we find that antiderivative is the same as before. Essentially, we're going to guess. Because the uh, function that we started with has an exponent in it that's in the denominator, let's rewrite this with a negative exponent instead, so x plus 1 to the minus second power. And now we need to guess an antiderivative for this. Well, because of the exponent to the minus second, probably we need to increase that by 1, right? Derivatives decrease the power by 1, so uh, an antiderivative increases the power by 1. Um, if we took a derivative of something like 
our guess so far. The stuff inside the parentheses wouldn't change, but we want that to be x plus 1, so probably we want an x plus 1 here. And if you think about taking the derivative of our guess so far, an extra minus sign would show up because of the chain rule. So we're probably going to need a minus sign there. Now if you actually check uh, that this check this antiderivative by taking its derivative, you do get f prime, 1 over x plus 1 squared. So this, anti, this uh, formula for f is correct. Of course, we need a plus c. Okay, so we have most of a formula for the function f, but we haven't used this initial value yet, or this initial condition. But this initial condition says that f of 1 is 3. Well, we have a formula for f. We can plug 1 into it and set that equal to 3 and see what that says. So when we plug 1 in here for, at, for x, well, 1 plus 1 is 2 to the minus first power. Looks like I forgot my minus sign out front, plus c. And you can see, just like in the last example, we got an equation where c is the only unknown, so we can find c. So this is 3 equals minus, let's see, 2 to the minus first, that's 1 over 2, plus a constant. And then add a half to both sides, c is 3 and a half, otherwise known as 7 halves. So the function that we want, f of x, is negative x plus 1 to the minus first plus 7 halves. So this function, little f, has the derivative that we wanted, and also it goes through that initial point, 1 comma 3. Now it might seem a little artificial, this, this example, declaring that somehow we know what the slope of the tangent line is, but we don't know the original function. That seems like the sort of math problem only a math teacher could love. Um, but this is actually a, a common situation in uh, other fields, for example, in physics. So let's, example, let's imagine that a cart is moving along a track so that at time t, its velocity is given by this function v of t, which is x squared plus 4x. If the cart starts at position 3 at time 0, let's find the position function p of t of the cart after t seconds. So we want this position function p of t, and we know this velocity function v of t. Well, what's the relationship between position and velocity? The relationship between position and velocity is that velocity is the derivative of position. If you knew the position function, you could find the velocity function by taking a derivative. But this time we know the velocity function. So to get back to the position function, we need to undo this time derivative. In other words, we need to calculate an antiderivative. Okay, so now we have a plan. We're going to find the antiderivative of v, and then, if you look carefully, we have an initial value. At, at time 0, the position should be 3. So that's our initial condition. I'll abbreviate that. Initial condition is right here. At time 0, the position is 3. Okay, so now we can start calculating. So our position function is an antiderivative of v. So for the first term in v, x squared, we need to come up with an antiderivative. So a derivative would decrease the exponent by 1, so an antiderivative should increase it by 1. But if you imagine taking the derivative of x cubed, you'd get a 3 down in front. But we don't want a 3 in front up in our velocity function, there's no 3 there, so we need a 1 3rd waiting in front here. Now if you imagine taking the derivative of 1 3rd x cubed, the 3 would come down, cancel the 3rd, turn into x cubed, or x squared, and we'd have what we wanted, x squared. All right, plus, 
4 times x to the, well, let's see, it's going to be x squared. But if you take a derivative of x squared, that 2 is going to come down. So this, this 4, it would turn into an 8. And we don't want an 8 there. So whatever, whatever number we put in front here is, would get multiplied by 2 when you take a derivative. So to end up with a 4, we need a 2 there to begin with. OK, so that's our antiderivative. Of course, plus some unknown constant c. But remember, we have an initial condition, 0, 3. And we can use that initial condition to find uh, the value of c. So 3 is supposed to be equal to p of 0. But p of 0 is just c. I see I've put x's here instead of t's. These should all be t's. All right, so now we know c, it's 3, and that means that the position function, p of t, is 1 third t cubed plus 2t squared plus 3. And now I see I even put x up here instead of t. All right, so again, if you know a derivative, in this case our derivative was a velocity, if you know a derivative and an initial condition, you can find the original function by taking an antiderivative and using the initial condition to find the unknown constant. All right, let's look at one more example of thinking about antiderivatives. So here's a graph, and this is a graph of y equals f prime of x. Let's sketch the graph of an antiderivative of this function that goes through the point minus 1, minus 1. So I guess first thing we should do is plot the point minus 1, minus 1. That's right here. Actually, let me change this problem. Let me make this minus 1 a plus 1. OK, so the point minus 1 plus 1 is right here. And what we're going to have to do is, uh, as, we sketch, as we sketch our graph for f, we need to make it so that the slope of the tangent line, the slope of the graph that we're drawing is the same as the height of the graph that we're looking at. So at our starting x value, minus 1, The derivative here is negative. And that means that our graph should have a negative slope. It looks like it's about minus 1. So our graph should look something like this. Now, as we continue to the right, the derivative, f prime, it looks like it stays minus 1 for a while. So our graph continues having slope minus 1. So it continues down like this. At about, say, this x value here, the derivative starts increasing. It was minus 1, and then it starts increasing towards 0. And so the slope of what we draw starts increasing and heading towards 0. So when a slope heads towards 0, that means the graph is leveling out, so something like this. Eventually, the derivative function reaches 0. What does it look like for a derivative to be equal to 0? Well, when a derivative is equal to 0, that's a critical point. That's a level spot in the graph. So right here, we should have a, a level spot in the graph. Immediately to the left, the derivative is negative. And immediately to the right of this critical point, the derivative should be positive. So our function needs to go from being level, or slope 0, to having positive slope, so something like this. And as you continue to the right, the slope increases even more. So at this spot where the derivative had an x-intercept, our function had a local min. And that makes sense. That matches up with what we know about the first derivative test. All right, so let's go back to our initial point here at minus 1, comma 1. Now if we move towards the left, we need a tangent line whose slope uh, is heading towards 0 again. So that's going to be like this. And at x equals minus 2, the slope should be equal to 0. 
So that's a critical point again. So where the derivative had an x-intercept, the original function, the antiderivative, has a, a critical point. As we continue to the left, our function starts having a positive slope. Remember, the slope of what we draw is the height of this derivative graph. On the derivative graph, to the left of negative 2, all of the heights are positive. And so we need to draw a graph whose slope is positive. And that's going to look like this. OK, so from the graph of the derivative function and an initial value, one single data point, we were able to sketch the graph of the derivative function.